We are up to question and answers 11. This is um, a good start to your day. I hope so. If you've got uh, questions that you ever want to send in to us, we'll always be answering them. But um, this is from Tom Bristow, uh, and he's asking a question that I think is very common, and people are wondering what's the difference between dried oak dried in a kiln and then oak that has been air dried. And there's a huge difference between the two. They're not one and the same by the time they're finished in the process. So what I want to say is there is uh, going to be a different answer from different people. Contact a wood, wood supply company. They're going to say, oh, kiln dried is superior. It's down to 11%. It's wonderful wood. It's all of this. But what they don't know is what we know is that the wood has been forced dried. It's, we've forced it down to a moisture level of 7%, 8%, and it doesn't need to be forced to that level, but that's what it does. And then it resaturates itself according to the atmosphere around itself. So that's going to exchange for the rest of its life. Wood expands and contracts with moisture. But air drying is the superior way. Air drying, if you can get it, is the very best. It doesn't get it low enough for working with in most climates, but what it does is it allows about a year for every inch of thickness for that wood to acclimate, and the fibers inside are arranging themselves, and they are, the wood is much more stable, and that's what we want, the stability of the wood. So air dried is best, but it's harder to get. So I would go for air dried, for sure, if I can get it. And then I can put it in a kiln and drop it down a little bit more, or just take it into my house or my garage, put the heater on, and it will reduce the moisture content to what I want. Um, this one comes from Brian Spillane, and he says, I just purchased several one inch and half inch new gouges, and I'm, having, and I'm using abrasive paper to hold my tools. I would like suggestions on how to apply them to the gouges, particularly when initializing the back. So the gouge has a curve. It can be an internal or external bevel on the, on the gouge. So I'll show you the contrasting two. Here's one where we have a, a bevel on the inside, and here's one where the bevel is it's not. On the inside, it's flat, and the outside has the bevel to it. So we sharpen gouges with different shapes, different profiles, depending on the kind of work we're doing. If we're a carver, we'll use it for one thing. If we're a pattern maker, this would be more of a pattern maker's gouge here where you've got to put a long volute into a piece of wood. You sharpen this edge because you want a, a long, even groove or, or um, hollow on the underside of it. So the different gouges, I've got a few different types here just for the purpose of going through with this, uh, this with you. These are all out canal, so the bevel is on the outside. Here it's in canal, and that's what we're going to deal with. So what we do, you can use a broom handle if you want to, or you can make some shapes like this. I've just made these using the gouges as to get the profile. So I just made a mark on one end of a square piece of wood, and made another on the other end like this, and then I planed down the midsection that was square with a hand plane until I got the profile, sanded it, and then that gave me the profile that I wanted for this particular gouge. You can actually use a shallow gouge on this too. It doesn't have to conform exactly to the gouge. What we do from there, there are a couple of things also that you need. We also need a hollow in here. So we can take a wide hollow for a wider gouge and we can rotate into the piece of wood with this. If we've got a shallower sweep here like this one, that's not quite shallower. This one would work just fine. And so this again, we would put the abrasive paper inside here. Now it doesn't have to be glued down, but you can use double-sided tape. Glue this to the inside. The problem is you're going to be making several changes in the abrasive, uh, the abrasiveness. You'd start off with coarse, then go to fine, super fine, and so on. But then when this goes on here, we pull this in this direction. We don't push it into the surface because it's going to rip your paper or slice through your paper. So this gives you that profile. Flip over, anchor this again. I'll show you how I anchor mine. So this goes like this, and we can take this initial, this inside. But what this does is puts a bevel slightly on the inside. You may not want that, and in that case, 
you would put the profile at this end so it's, you feel for that flat and then pull and that will polish the inside. And you can get abrasive paper like this that goes all the way from 100 grit all the way through to thousands of grit and that will deal with that. But you can also charge this surface of any of these like this with chromium oxide, aluminum oxide, whatever you have and you can polish this and then you can polish your bevel like this on the piece of wood and get the exact polish you want. So that's the way I would sharpen my gouges. Um, what, was, what was the other? Oh, the other addition. When I'm loading this, usually I'll take this, slide it in my vise here, get it nearly tight and just pull this up. Can you see how that, what's, what happens here on the surface here? When I pull up, the paper is conforming to the shape there. Pull it up, cinch it tight with your knee. And then when you put your gouge on here, it's conforming that you can move from either side. And that's a perfect way. So here, different profiles, different sizes. You can pull this, you can get down here and you can get the inside of your gouge polished out. The same two though, in addition, we can take a piece of leather like this for the final polishing. If we don't want to polish the wood, we can put this in the vise. So this is just a piece of leather. Again, we've charged it with the green buffing compound here. And that's how we get this super polished edge that we might need for some of our carving, well, most of our carving work. That does that side. When you flip it over, you've got your hollow. Put that in the vise. It won't go down to the hollow unless you use double-sided tape. And if you wanted a permanent uh, strop, you can just glue that into the bottom with the double-sided tape and have it permanently conform to it. You don't need it because you can just pull this this way and it'll automatically go down into the valley and you've got a pristine surface that will cut just about anything you ever want to cut. That's how I would do it. It's worked for me for 50 years and I'm sure it'll work for you. Great. Good question. Thank you for that. Slide those out. Let's see what we have next. I like the ones where we demonstrate, but I like those too because they get straight to the point. This one says I'm having difficulty cutting mortises. I use Narex mortise chisels. My mortise holes tend to widen at the top. Typically with a 10 mil chisel, the top may be as much as 11 mil wide. When I do a trial fit, the first one centimeter may be quite loose, although the bottom is nice and snug. My tenons have a uniform thickness. Any suggestions as to what I'm doing wrong? Yes, what we're doing is we're wallowing out the mortise hole. Here's, I've got a mortise hole here I've cut sometime in the past. 3 8 chisel, where are you? Here. So even if it's a mortise chisel or a bevel edge chisel, no matter what type, when we go into the mortise hole, we're chopping and there's a tendency for us to chop, 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 and then we push and lever and we start taking out, can you see right in this corner, let me pull this over a little bit. When I put the chisel in, when I'm levering on the chisel, can you see how the corner of the chisel starts to wallow out the side of the hole? So that's what's happening. It's this part of this leveling and levering process here. That starts to wall. So it's just a, a question of establishing muscle memory and tone in your body and, and making you mentally aware of it to know that that's happening so that you prevent it. And eventually you'll get to the point where it's not really an issue for you. Okay. How to stop tear out when planing near a knot? Ooh, this is always a problem. Doesn't matter what kind of wood doesn't matter what kind of plane you have, usually this can be a major issue. So here I picked out a piece of oak and um, what I 
You can see you've got tear out here. This is where it's gone through the planer actually and it's got all this tear out here. So even with machines, it, it, you know, unless you have a spiral cutter head in your planer or something like that, this can happen. Ultra sharpness on your tool edge, whether it's a machine or a hand tool, will really help with this. But I'm going to try to um, show you what's happening here because this, can you see this round spot on the top here and this uh, configuration of the grain? That means that this is the top of layered grain. So if we look inside here, you can see the growth rings following the radius here of the tree as it was growing. And then something happened right on this spot and I start reading the grain when I think, oh, well, I'm gonna hand plane this. Would I plane that area? Probably not. And the reason is because the probably not becomes a real knot. And there is the knot. So this was the branch on the tree. This is the inside of the tree. So it's going all the way to the outside. Tone grain is very common around these areas, very wild. What do you do? You read the grain first and then you have to decide whether you're going to plane it. A bevel up plane, bevel down plane, I don't care which one you use. This is a problem area for sure. So here I'm planing. I didn't think this through and I start planing. Now this area was pretty clear until I started planing. So I'm gonna to try to replicate, this is smooth here, but I'm gonna to try to replicate what damage can be done with this plane. And in 90% of cases, this plane will actually operate better than a bevel up plane. And I don't wanna get into the argument, it's my experience I'm going off. So here, the grain is tearing miserably. So, but on this side of the knot where all that tear out was, this one is actually getting better. So let's take a look at what I did. I misread the grain, I'm planning in here. Can you see that? I've got all this torn grain here. What I would normally do is I probably wouldn't plane this area or even try to. If I go the other way and read this grain correctly, I put it in this way, I can plane that area. But what's happening on the other side of this, this area is now tearing. So I don't know if there's an answer. I might want to use the plane. See, look what happened here. Again, the grain is tearing because I misread the grain. So I've got torn grain here, torn grain here. And this is really what I would do in a situation like that. I probably wouldn't even start planing it. I would reach for this number 80 scraper. Let's see what we get with this. So by orienting this, it will work in any direction. So I've gone into this end grain rising. This is where the grain is rising up here. I've gone into this end grain here and here it's definitely taking out swathes of damaged grain without any issue. I can turn it around. So I was going against the grain in some of those circumstances and now I'm going with the grain. And this is the answer to life's problems. If you have a number 80 or a Veritas uh, two-handed scraper, it's called a cabinet scraper, this will take care of that problem and that's what I would do. I wouldn't even get into bevel up, bevel down because this is the answer. So we've got the board grain, awkward grain. These are things that come up all the time when we're working with wood and this is the challenge but that's what we want. We want those kind of awkward areas. Once we overcome them, we feel like a million dollars or even a hundred pounds. Okay. Okay, this gentleman, I think, Adam, is saying, I am sharpening an antique warranted superior crosscut hands. Well, that must have been made in Britain. Can't imagine it not be, but anyway. Okay, these saws have a curved spine and mine also has a slight radius heel. So what you think he's saying by curved spine, he's saying that the back edge of the 
uh, saw has a curve in its length and we call that a, it's a taper but with, it's got a scallop in it, exactly what he says. This one has a straight edge along the back. What he's saying is it has a skew back in here. That's what we call a skew back saw. Just for clarity. And has a slight radius heel to toe on the teeth side. So what he's saying on this side, this one's dead straight along its length. And what he's saying is it's bellied. It's what we call a bellied saw, if you like. It's... Um, Got a breasted saw, what we call a breasted saw. And so what he wants to know is how he levels the teeth. So what I drew up here, I think represents what he's thinking he has. So this is the toe of the saw, toe of the saw. And he has some hollows in here, then it's breasted and then it has a hollow back here. And what, he, what we really do with that is we take a file, a flat file like this, and we push it along the high spots like this and make an arcing motion like this across the surface until we end up with a nice even surface. What that does is it gives us a level to sharpen the points of the existing teeth too. So then we start filing the teeth either side because on the top of the point or where they should have points, they're all now flats. And we file down and even out that flat. So work from both sides of the tooth until we get a decent tooth again and we get a a breasted saw that has no undulation. If it has undulation in it, when you start sawing, it bites on one spot and then it releases and bites on another and makes it an objectionable way of working with the saw. Okay. This is my last question. How can I reuse or recycle shavings? I gave them, I give them to my neighbors for their hamster cage. Yeah, that would take about two seconds to get rid of my shaving. I mean, it just takes so long when you start building them up. He's saying he's just burning them, which is a great option for starting a fire. I don't know anything that starts a fire better than shavings, wood shavings. That's what we do. For years, I've had this problem of getting rid of my shavings. What I did is I went out and bought 25 chickens, built a chicken coop, and that resolved the issue for me because I took that, those shavings, put them into the chicken coop, did the nesting boxes with them, nice clean eggs. And then, you know, you don't have to really go out. But if you're a gardener, it's perfect because then you can take a tiller and you can till the shavings from the coop side of the chicken coop. And you can put that into your compost or straight onto your garden because it's going to deteriorate. It's going to be fixing the nitrogen in the soil and things like that, the shavings. So it works perfectly for that. That's what I would do with my shavings. Then again, you could make Christmas decorations and things like that. There's all kinds of things you can do with it. Just be inventive. Mulching on the garden is really good. It stops the evaporation of water from the soil and it dulls out the weeds so it blocks the weeds. It's a great weed blocker too. So thank you. Those are great questions. Please follow us on our YouTube channel. We want to keep building up these questions so that people get more and more knowledgeable about what you can do with your shavings or how to make shavings or how to get your plane working. This is great for reaching an audience all over the world. Thank you.